It's good to know that we serve a faithful God. Amen? Amen. One that loves us and cares for us, knows what we need before we even need it. That's a good God. Amen? Amen. Supplies all our needs according to his riches, not our own. I don't know about you, but you missed a really good time to say amen right there. Not according to our own, but according to what he's done for us. Amen? Amen. We have been talking for the last several weeks. <clears throat> you want to call it a series, you can say we have. I've been really dealing with fighting, the fight of faith. And we all realize that as long as that we're in this race, that sometimes we have to fight our way through it. I wish, as I said before, I wish I can tell you that everything is hunky-dory and all roses. But you know what? When you're doing what's right for the kingdom of God, the enemy don't like it. And he will try to do everything he can to destroy that. I said once that I believe everybody has ministry. And if the enemy can get to your marriage, he gets to your ministry. And so... I don't know about you, but I have a marriage worth fighting for. Amen. 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 She kind of cute. Amen. 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 Don't fight with you. Fight for. That's right. We fight together. Amen. amen. We take anything out, can we, baby? Come on. You ready? Come on. Back to back. Back to back. That'll preach. Amen. amen. So <clears throat> I've been dealing with fighting. I've been dealing with you know don't faint during time of adversity. Uh, I think last week. Also dealt with um, the prize, what we're all fighting for, the prize. <clears throat> and I really think maybe perhaps I've left out something that I should have probably did at the very beginning. Because this week as I was praying, I really realized that we can't fight without being trained. And I realized that there's some scriptures that talks about training and the process of training. And I know for myself... You know, look at me now, and you don't think, well, there's no way you would have done that. But many years ago, I fought in, in 1972, I fought Junior Olympics. And I remember we trained for a year before we ever got in the ring. Yeah. So, I mean, you guys that are, know anything about battle, you don't go to battle unless you train first. You because if you go to battle without training, then chances are you get your teeth kicked in. Amen? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I said before, and, and, I, and I shared this this morning... Uh, we had a, a situation, I remember in the early 90s when Russia became open and we realized that Russia, we thought, was going to be open for a short period of time. And so we wanted to put as many missionaries as we could on the field. And so we were just taking people who were volunteering, you know, in the church and just, man, we were putting them on the field in Russia. And we realized really quickly, it wasn't very long after that, that a lot of those people were just getting their teeth kicked in. And they were coming home defeated. There were some of the missionaries, I'll tell you, it's sadly to say this, but some of those are not even in church today. Yeah. Because what happened was they got over there and they wasn't trained yeah. and they got defeated. Yeah. And I realized for me, I was very fortunate because I came right at the second wave because when I decided I felt like I wanted to go, I thought I was ready to go. And my pastor said, no, we're not sending anybody unless we send them to training. So Julia and I had the privilege of going to seminary. And I look back and I realize, man, I'm so glad I went yeah. because, you know, when I got there, I realized there were some things that I probably would have got my teeth kicked in if I wouldn't yeah. have the training for it. And so in this battle, this fight that we call life, that we have to be trained for, there's some certain things. I want to kind of pick up a few things that we've read before, but I want to highlight them again. But it's talking about in 1 Timothy 1, 18, he's talking about fighting the good fight. And he says it again. He says, this charge I commit to you, son, Timothy. We know Paul is really, Timothy is, is Paul is mentoring Timothy, so he's calling him his son. And many of us are being mentored by other people ahead of us in the gospel, in the faith. According to the uh, prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare. He's, again, he's talking about, I commit this to you. You're fixing to put on a fight, but I want to give you everything you have to fight with. He says, having faith and a good conscience, 
He said, which some have rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. Now, again, he's talking about, listen, I want you to understand you got a fight in your hand, but I want you to also understand there's some people that's been fighting that wasn't really prepared to fight, and they crashed. Yeah. Amen? Oh, no. Amen. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> throughout the Scripture, we see this. We jump over in 611, but he jumps up and he says, But you, O man of God, flee these things and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, gentleness, And he says, fight the good fight of faith. Now, for us, I read that and I say, but you, O man of God, I fill in the blank and I can say, oh, you, O woman of God, you, O youth of God, whatever. We need to understand we need to flee these things and pursue righteousness. God wants us to fight the good fight of faith. Now, let's jump to 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. He says, if you explain these things to the brothers, I'm reading this in in the Living Translation. He says, if you explain these things to the brothers and sisters, Timothy, you'll be a worthy servant of Christ Jesus. In other words, if you explain these things I've taught you, you'll be worthy of it. He says, one who is nourished by the message of faith and good teaching you have followed. Verse 7, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas and old wives' tales. I love that. Because, you know, there's many times if we're not careful, we just get caught up in arguing about things that just don't matter. I, I, I've been in those things. I've been in those denominations. They spend all their time on the pulpit. And in my opinion, they might be important for a moment, but they, some things just don't matter. Yeah. What matters is what we, you know, we're doing today in the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. That's what matters. And some people fight over the silliest things, and they spend their whole... Anyway, I'll leave that alone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> he said, instead, train yourself to be godly. He says, physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life, which we talk about the prize, and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is a Savior of all the people, particularly of all the believers. Now, when you use this word training here... It was actually one of the Greek words that was used for gymnastics, which, you know, they they had to train to become gymnasts. Amen? Amen. And so it's a great illustration here because, listen, I don't know about you, but you can tell me you're a gymnast, but if I put you on the rings, the truth will come out. (laughs) Amen? Amen. For me personally, you put me on the rings, it's going to be around my head. Amen? I'm coming down. (laughs) Because I, I seen some of those guys can take those rings and stretch their arms out and hold their body weight up and all that kind of good stuff, and they make it look really easy. But I promise you, they didn't just start yesterday. It was a process. Because some of those guys, you want to call them head and shoulders because they ain't got no neck. Amen. It just, I mean, just right there. There's training process that takes place, and we have to believe as a body of Christ that we have to know that we're in training. And we're not going to, you know, you're not going to, you know, one of the things he talks about also, he talks about some of the qualifications for leadership. And one of the qualifications he says for leadership is you can't be novice, okay? Because if you're novice and all of a sudden something happens, you get all puffed up. And guess what? There's been a lot of people that are novice and try to get into leadership that got their teeth kicked in. Amen? And so when you read these things, you know, you know what happens a lot of times? This is what happens. We read these things. And Mark, sometime we go, you know what, that's for sister so-and-so. That's not really for me. <laughs> really. We read these things sometime we go, you know, I know that's what it says, but, man, Joe needs that. I, me? No, I'm good. <laughs> we're, we're really fooling ourselves. Because, see, everything he writes is for all of us. Amen. All of us. Amen. Listen, he knows us on an individual basis. Right. He knows what we're all capable of. He knows what we're thinking. And right now, I'm glad I don't know what you're thinking. Amen? Because some of you might be thinking, man, I just put that pot roast in. That boy, I bet that gravy's really cooking. And man, whew, let's go home. (laughs) Or other things. I'll leave it alone. But, you know, he talks about training here. Now, he jumps up again, and he says over in 1 Timothy uh, 4.11, he says, teach these things and insists that everyone learn them. Then he talks about being an example. He's talking about reading scriptures to the church. He talks about not neglecting the, the spiritual gifts. Then we jump over to 2 Timothy 3, 14. He's, but you must remain faithful to the things you have been taught. We have to remain faithful to the things we're taught. Because if we're not, we get off course, right? Verse 16, he says, All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. 
It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. I remember for myself, and I'm speaking on a personal level, whenever I remember wanting to go to Russia, and I remember thinking that I really had it together. Yeah. I really did. I thought, man, I'm a businessman. I'm successful. I can do that. I realized quickly that I didn't have it together. But one of the things I realized in my maturity as I begin to grow with the things of God, I will share this with you. One of the things when I came home from Russia, the one of the things that I begged for, I begged for from my pastor was correction. Yeah, yep. Some of you think, oh, I want correction. Well, let me tell you why we don't want correction, because we don't want anybody to know our faults. Yeah. Yeah. But when we really mature up and we say, you know what? <laughs> Listen, there's something wrong there. Correct me. What we're saying is, man, listen, I trust you. I understand that you know a little bit more than I do about this thing. And if you see something wrong in my life, I don't have to make the mistake you made. Yes, see, I don't know about you, but I don't have to pet a snake to know a snake bites. I've seen them bite. I watch TV. I've seen Crocodile Dundee. I've seen all these things. I know what these things do. I don't have to fool with them. You see, a wise person don't have to fool with them. A wise person can learn by your mistakes. Amen. Most of us like, Amen. let me share this with you, and please don't shout me down when I say this. <laughs> when a parent tells me that their kids, well, they just have to go through, they have to learn for themselves, that is a lie from the pits of hell. It's a lie. Because you know what? Guess what? If you're a really good parent, you don't want your children to go through some of the things you went through. And if, you tr if your children really trust you, they won't go through some of the things you went through. Now, I'm not saying that ch children will make their own decisions. And I'm not saying that you could be the perfect parent and your kids still make wrong decisions. But I'm telling you, when somebody tells me somebody has to go through that, they have, they have to learn. But, brother, that's like saying let your kids at two years old throw them in the water and, and watch them swim. You know, well, they don't swim. That's their fault. Well, that's really bright. Well, they can't ride the bicycles on the, in the grass, so put them on the freeway and let them ride the bicycles. If they get run over, that's just their fault. How many times have, you, have your daddy ever said that to you? If you get hurt, don't come crying to me. <laughs> well, who else am I going to cry to? Amen? <laughs> if you get your leg cut off, don't come crying to me. Oh, well, okay. I'll just sit there and bleed to death, you know? We, we've said some really silly things over the years. We've used some really unusual antidotes. I know sometimes, yeah, but I, and look, as a parent, I know this, because I'm in times, I've said things out of my mouth, and the minute I said it, I was going, oh, my God, my dad used to say that. Because you used to say, I'll never say that, but it comes right out. It just rolls so easily off the tongue. Well, guess what? Timothy's trying to tell us, listen, you don't have to go through something. Let me tell you what to do here. Let me train you so you don't have to be destroyed. Come on, somebody. See, when we can understand that somebody loves us enough to care so much about us that he's going to tell us what not to do, that's a good thing. Why? Because some of these things they went through. And so we learn here. Now, I wrote this thing down, a few things down. I said, if we fail to train spiritually, we become people with doubt. Come on. Confusion. Uh, what do you say it? Mediocracy, which means really being lukewarm or, or quit trying, quit caring. Yeah. Look, there are some people that just throw up their hand and quit. Yeah. I've been pastor now. We fix to celebrate our 15th year, right? 15th year. And unfortunately, I have seen over the time, I've seen people just because something happens in their life, because of something happened in their family, because of something happened in their marriage, or whatever the case may be, just throw up their hands and quit. Yeah. Just quit. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and the sad thing is, you know, let me say it this way. The sad thing is the world tells them it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. It's, you got a right to do that. you got a right to feel that way. You, gotta, you know, if, we can, if we're not careful, we buy into the philosophy of the world. The Bible says, you know, don't buy into man's philosophy. That's what it says. It says beware. It gives us this warning. Beware of men's philosophy that, that cheats you through empty deceit and all these other things. we got to beware of these things. So all these things we're talking about, doubt, confusion. Listen. If, if you're spiritually weak and you're spiritually not trained, when something happens, guess what happens? Doubt sets in. Doubt will set in. Now, I don't know about you, but everyone in this room at some level has had some ounce of doubt creep in somewhere. Now, what happens is, is when you're trained, you know how to remove that doubt. 
okay? It's like having an infection. If you got a cut and you got an infection, then you put medication to get that infection out. I know for me, several years ago, I had a uh, gallbladder that was gangrene, and I didn't realize that I was dying, and I didn't realize how painful it was until it happened to me. And I remember they went in and they cut me wide open. And I'm telling you, they ripped me from one side to the other side. I stayed a week in the hospital. As painful as it was to have this incision all the way across, I felt 100% better because the infection was gone yeah. out of my body. Now, sometimes it's painful to get the infection out. But guess what? It's a necessary thing. Because once you get it out of your body, you start feeling 100% better. Amen? You can start mending. Now, I said this also. I said, training is what we need, not what we want. That's good. Good because some of us don't want to train. Now, I don't know about you, but when somebody tells me, let's get up and do insanity, I think you're crazy. Amen? <laughs> now, do I want the results? I'd love to have the results. If I could take a pill and just say, okay, you get that six-pack, brother, I'd be ticka, 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 ticka. Why? Because it's an easy fix. But guess what? It, it's, it's, it's hard because, you see, the keys and rules of godly training, it takes discipline, it takes practice, and it takes sacrifice. Now, I don't know about you. I read an article one time, and it said that, you know, those who eat really right and those who don't eat right, their expectancy between the years is like a year and a half between the two. And I thought for a moment, for a year and a half difference, bring on the kingdoms, you know. I mean, if that's all I get out of this thing is a year and a half, Man, bring on the pie, you know? I mean, you know, it takes sacrifice to, to put those things away, amen? Uh, Y'all, some of you look like, oh, shame. Some of you are thinking, I wish I had a kingdom right now. <laughs> but we have to be disciplined. If we're going to really train, it takes discipline. It takes a lot of discipline to train. It takes a lot of practice to get it right, amen? Now, here's the first thing. We're talking about godly training. The first thing that I want to say is this. Godly training means we must be teachable. We've got to be teachable. There are some people that are so stinking hard-headed that I don't care. You look, look I, I, I'm just telling you, after 15 years, when I run across that person that don't want to be teachable, I don't waste my time. Because it doesn't matter what you say. They're going to look at you and go, uh, and do whatever they want to do. If you don't want to be teachable, then, then guess what? You will never, ever go through training. Because, listen... I'm filtering. I'm filtering. I'm processing. I'm looking the other way. I'll say it. No, I won't. Anyway, training, you just got to, you got to, you got to use some wisdom in this thing. Amen? You got to, like right now, I'm using wisdom. Not say it, not say it, not say it. Training. I mean, you know, I remember me personally. I remember when I was off at seminary, and I remember going to some of these classes. Have you ever been in any Bible classes? I know Mark, you guys, some of them went to... You know, Joe and some of his taking class. Listen, you'll find out real quick. Some of these people come in these things. They're so stinking dogmatic. Yeah. They're so dogmatic in the way they think and until that they, they really don't last long. Uh, I'll be honest. They're so dogmatic. And I remember having these students in my class, and they were so dogmatic about certain things, and I wasn't. And I wasn't. And I was a little gray about it. And, I, and it really it bothered me. I got really bothered by it. I was thinking... I came home, I told you, I said, Julia, I said, man, some of these people are so dogmatic about some of these things. And, and for me personally, I'm a little gray about it. I'm not really sure. And so I, I felt so bad about it until I went to one of my professors and I asked him the question. And I said, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, I felt like some of these people are so dogmatic and I felt like that I'm a little gray in some of these areas. You know what he said to me? That's what he said to me. He said, you're teachable. And this is what he said. He said, you're teachable. And he said, not only that, he said, there's going to come a time. So there's going to come a time when you're going to be really dogmatic about what you believe. And some of these things that you might be a little gray on right now, it's going to be clear for you. It's going to clear up. And it has. Because, see, there's some things you ain't going to shake me from. There are some things that you ain't going to, you can all walk out. There's certain things that I won't move off of. Without the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no remission for your sins. You know, these are the things that you will not move me off of. And some things, I'll be honest with you, they just don't matter. They don't matter. And we can sit there and argue till we blew in the face about things that we think matter. And in the light of eternity, they just don't matter. But some things need to be teachable. He even says in Romans 2.21, it says, You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? In other words, you teach others, you can't learn yourself? Listen, Trish would tell you in a heartbeat, the ladies back there, the men back there are working, they're learning themselves. 
They might be teaching the curriculum, but guess what? Most of them are learning it for the first time. And if you think you can go back there and teach your kids without you knowing it, they're going to eat your lunch. So you have to be teachable. Now, he says in Deuteronomy, and he speaks about it here, and he talks about the Israelites, and he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. He's teaching a commandment here, but this is what's really important. Verse 7. He said, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk on the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them on the sign of your hand, and they shall be a, a, a fortlet between your eyes. Frontlets between your eyes. Right there. Amen. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. In other words, listen, he's trying to tell them, you're going to take every moment that you can and teach them. These things that you're learning, you teach them when you go to bed at night. You teach them when you wake up in the morning. You teach them when you walk outside cutting grass. You teach them when you're driving down the road. You teach them all day long. Why? Because this is the opportunity we have to understand. We have to be teachable so every moment of the day we can find something to learn. Amen? Amen? As well as teaching others. Here's the next thing. Talking about training. Training requires us taking responsibility. Now, what do you mean by that? We have to have ownership. We have to own it. Listen, if you're going to be in training, you've got to be responsible for yourself. You can tell me. You can tell me all day long. Yeah, Pastor, I've been outside jogging. Woo. I've been running every day. All of a sudden, you get put in a little marathon, and about a mile down the road, you're on the side of the road going, <gasps> I know you wouldn't, man. You would sit in front of your TV drinking Dr. Pepper, eating a moon pie. Come on, somebody. You have to be responsible for yourself. If you're not responsible for yourself, no one else can be responsible for you. You can't, look, you can, you can, what's the old saying? You can bring a, a, a horse to water, but you can't make him drink, so to speak. You have to be responsible. And see, what really kills me is we live in a society that everybody wants to blame everybody else. Oh, say it. Say it. Now, listen, I know, I, I, I pastor church. I've had people, people leave the church because their kids got into sin and they want to blame the pastor for it. I didn't have nothing to do with it. Well, it's that church. That's why my son would, with little Susie in the back seat. I didn't have nothing to do with little Susie in the back seat. Come on, say it. You let little Susie leave to go with little Johnny in the back seat. Come on, somebody. Come on, say it. Everybody wants to blame everybody for something else. Listen, you need to take responsibility. We quit pointing fingers. Listen, that's why I get so mad at politicians when they get up there and all of a sudden, they, I'm going to make all these promises in a year until what they're, they're doing or whatever the case, they're still blaming the guy that came before them. Man, don't tell me that. Man, own up to what you've got and take responsibility. When I took this church, I'll be honest with you, 15 years ago when I took this church, there were some issues that took place. But guess what? I promise you, if you were here during that time, you never heard about one of those issues. Why? Because I took responsibility and said, you know what? We got this thing. It's up and running. We're going to run with it. And I ran with it. It was probably years later before some of the people that were in the church even found out about some of the things. Why? Because it wasn't, listen, I took responsibility. God called me. I said, listen, if this thing sinks, I'm going to sink with it. We got to get in this boat. We got to realize that, you know what? We have to be responsible for ourselves. Wow. Pastor, that's good preaching. It goes on to say, it says in Galatians 6, 5, each of you must take responsibility for doing the creative best you can with your own life. Be very sure now, you who have been trained to a self-sufficient maturity, that you enter into a generous common life with those who have trained you, sharing all the good things that you have experienced. In other words, you know what? When you're, when you're confident in yourself and you have been trained and you take responsibility, you can train others. If, if, if you're not confident in yourself and you don't take responsibility for yourself, you know, it's kind of like, and I'm, I, I, I'm really bad about this one. I'll be honest with you. When my grandkids come to me and they say, Papa, can we go? I don't know. I always say, ask your Nana. <laughs> <laughs> I pass it off on her, you know, because I don't want to take responsibility if, if I had to go back and say no, you know. <laughs> but that's, that's something different. Amen? <laughs> that's grandkids. I ain't going to be the bad guy. You know what I do when we leave, they leave the room? I say, baby, I wanted to go. as Nana didn't want to go. <laughs> Nana! I say, oh, that, that's that old Nana for you, man. Papa wanted to take you. <laughs> 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 
I'm taking ownership right now. She's owning it right now, amen? Here's the next thing. We can't train without being active. You got to put some time into this thing. You got to be active into it. He even says here, uh, where I wonder, uh, verse 6 there, he says, And I am praying that you will put into active action the gen- What? Where am I at? Get the ownership. <laughs> Thanks, James. I thought you were on my side there, man. Forget it. I'm going to another one for that. James 1.22. Be, be, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in the mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, immediately forgets what kind of man he was. <laughs> But he, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, I'll just stop it. Huh? Won't be the first time, amen? I take responsibility of that. But he who is preaching, leave him alone while he's preaching. What does that say? Amen, amen. That's first Bobby Joe 316. Amen. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetter, hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessing what he does. You got to do it, man. You got to put some time into it. You got to have some activity into it. You can't be training with. You got to get off the couch and get in the game. You got to get off the treadmill and get on the track. You know, it's that's right. You, you can easily holler at the TV all day long. Wow, that quarterback. Get in the game. Listen, I know good and well. I ain't getting no game. When those three hundred pound guys are running after me. I'm going to curl up like a little girl. <laughs> I, 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 that hurt, man. Those guys are big. But the point here is we're in a, we're in a game of life. And if you're going you're gonna to really train this thing, you've got to get into this thing. Listen, if you're not in it, you, you, if you don't use it, you're going to lose it. You've got to get into the activity of life. Amen? You've got to be a doer of the word, not just a sayer only. Here's the next thing. When we are in godly training, we must be quick to overcome injury. You got to quick to overcome it. If you're in training, I will tell you, you will be injured. You'll pull a muscle. Something's going to happen. But guess what? You can, you, can, you can pacify that muscle. You can pacify that thing, and you can stay in bed. And guess what? You can give an excuse of why you're not in the game, but you'll never get back in the game. You got to get up and get going. You got to keep training. I love this passage of Scripture here, first, second, uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 2 Corinthians 4, 7. He says, but we have this treasure in earthly vessels. That is the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for, for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in the moral flesh so that the death is working in us, but life in you. you Romans 12, 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil there with good. Go. First John 4, 4 says, We are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he's in the world. We have to believe that we can overcome these things. And, and let me tell you something. These injuries that we get are real injuries. They're real. Listen, some of you have been hurt. Some of you have been so hurt until you didn't want to get out of bed. Some of you have had, listen, anger is an injury. We can get so mad until we just, we're no good anymore. Listen, depression is real. Listen, you got to overcome these things that I'm talking about. These are real issues that you have to learn to overcome in this training process. I told the story this morning, and I've probably shared it before from the past, and, but there was a pastor here in the city who I was really good friends with. I mean, we became good friends. Matter of fact, we were praying together when 12, uh, 9-11 happened. We were praying together. I remember us spending some time together. And he pastored a really good church in the community. And uh, he came to me one day, and he said, I'm really dealing with some depression. And so I counseled him as much as I could, and I prayed with him and encouraged him and tried to do everything I could to help him through some of his depression. But he would, he would constantly fall into this depression. And it was really a, really a weight on his shoulders. And so he told me that he was going to share it with some of his leadership. And so he did. And the sad thing was his leadership thought he was ungodly, so they run him off. Listen to me. 
And it was several years ago, uh, Julia and I took some time off. And this is the main reason we took some time. I called the leadership to my house and, and spoke to them and told them what was really placed in my heart. I needed to take some time off. We did. We took a month off. But this guy who I, I love dearly, I, I hadn't seen him in probably a while at this point, and uh, I saw one of the, the, the leaders that was in his church, and I asked about him. I said, Hi, how's so-and-so? And I asked him his name. And they looked at me just kind of bewildered, and they said, you didn't hear, did you? And I said, hear what? He said he put a gun in his mouth and blew his brains out. And it really hit me. It really, really hit me. Because I realized that I don't care where you're at or what level you are in this thing we call Christianity, whether you're a pastor or you're a plumber, or, or it doesn't matter, man. All of us have to get back in the game. All of us have to overcome anger, overcome hurt, overcome depression, overcome all these things that the enemy tries to throw at you, and he will throw at you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, he will. Well, Pastor was speaking. I, God really laid something on my heart. He's been talking a lot about equating, you know, how we train to, to an, a sporting event. And I was just thinking when an athlete gets injured, if an athlete gets the wrong treatment for that injury, and, and, and yeah, we've heard right. of athletes, they'll go and they, their coach wants them to play so bad that they'll shoot them through full of steroids or something to mask the symptoms. But that injury ends up becoming something permanent that devastates them the rest of their life. But the athlete that goes to the right person That's right. and gets That's the right, right medicine and the right therapy ends up getting well and is able to play and get back in the game again. Yeah. We get injured in life. We get injured from relationships. We get injured from, from sometimes sickness. Things come in our life and injure us. And sometimes we want to run to somebody. We're having marital trouble. And we'll run to a friend that's also having marital trouble. You know what you just did? You got the wrong fix for your injury. And it may end up causing you to completely say, you know what? I'm leaving my husband. I'm not going to work it out. I'm not going to get help. And not only are you devastated, your children are devastated, your, your other relationships become fractured, you got the wrong fix for your injury. But when you're injured, let me tell you two things. The Word of God has got medicine for whatever you That's need. Right. Yeah. And if you're looking, if you're looking, God will put people in your life right. that will help you, Amen. point you in the right direction yeah. so you can get healed from that injury and get back in the game. Amen. That's right. Praise the Lord. That's good. Amen. Amen. You're not trying to tell me something, are you? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but she's right. I mean, if we're not careful, you know, one of the dangerous things is going to the wrong person. Yes. Yes. And, and what happens a lot of times is we go to the wrong person because we want them to sympathize with us. Yes. And, and it's like, like your children. You know, I tell people all the time, look, when I was raising my sons, I was not their best friend. Come on, I was their dad. And there was a time that I had to tell them some things that they didn't want to hear. But guess what? I had to, I had to deal with it. Yes. Because if I didn't, I mean, I could tell them, you know, tell them anything they didn't want to hear and not be their dad, be their friend. Yes. Yes. But there's times if you, you need that right person in your life that's going to speak truth to you and tell you, listen, I love you, but you're wrong. Yes. And, and we almost to the point where, you know, you got to be almost willing to, to lose that relationship. Yes. Because if you don't, guess what? You might lose them anyway. Yes. Because you can lose them with the wrong Counsel. Amen? Amen? Here's the next thing. The last thing today is this, which I think is one of the most important things, is simply this. We're talking about training, talking about staying in the game. And the number one thing in training is never, never, never give up. Amen. You can't give up. You can't quit. You can't stop. you got to move on. You know, uh, uh, Luke 18.1 is a parable of the, uh, of the widow. And it was, she went to a judge, and, and Jesus was talking about her. And he says, one day Jesus told his disciples a story to show that they should, never, should always pray and never give up. Well, the story was that this lady went to the judge, and even though the judge didn't think she was right, he, he was so persistent and just kept like a bulldog, kept going and going and going and going. Finally, finally, she never gave up. He gave in. Now, another time when he's talking to him, there was a story about a, a young man who was traveling, and his friend, he went to his friend's house, and he knocked on the door and said, look, I've got people over, so can you give me bread? And the friend says, listen, we're all in bed. We're all asleep. Come back in the morning. Well, the Bible says the friend kept knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. And finally, the guy got up and gave him some bread. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, right after that is whenever the disciples said, teach us how to pray. Yeah. Because there are times in our life that I promise you, you cannot give up and quit. 
Now, if I ask people in this room, how many people in this room has ever felt like quitting? Well, probably 99.9% of us probably raised our hand at some level. Because, you know what, it's easy to quit. It's easy. And you know what's really great about quitting? You can justify why you quit. We can all justify it. But guess what? It's that person that stays in the game, doesn't give up, fights to the end, and says, you know what? Come hell or high water, I'm, gonna, I'm going through this thing. I'm not stopping. I, listen, I tell people all the time, if you're going through hell, don't stop. Keep going. Never give up. Never stop. You always got to press in. What's another scripture he says here in 2 Corinthians 4, 1? It says, therefore, since God in his mercy has given us this new way, we never give up. 2 Corinthians 4, 16, it says, this is, this is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying and our spirits are being renewed. It says, though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. That's good, isn't it? For our present troubles are small and won't last for long, yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix and gaze on things that cannot be seen. For the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. We live in a society that we want a quick fix. And, and unfortunately, that's, that's who we made up of. Yeah. I mean, if you go to pull in your McDonald's and you see the line too long, you go into Wendy's. Yeah. Yeah. Most of us, you know, we go to Wendy's and we just stayed at McDonald's, but we got our food before we ever got there. Yeah. Yeah. But we all want that quick fix. We all want that, that, that now. I want it now. I said to somebody one time, a guy was praying for patience. He said, I'm praying for patience and I want it now. We want that quick fix. Yeah. All of us do. Yeah. Yeah. We want that quick fix. But here's, here's the, the key to, to training is never, ever quit. Yeah. Never give up. Amen. You know, I, I love the story, and I've, I've used it many times, how uh, um, Winston Churchill was, was teaching or at, you know, speaking at, in, in, in England somewhere, and the, and the day was going, the night was going long, and he got up, and that's all he ever said. He said, never, 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 and he went on to say it, I don't know how many times, but he said, never, never, never quit. And they said that that was probably one of the most powerful speeches he ever had. And to this day, it's probably the speech that most people remember. One is short, but one is powerful. You know, you know powerful things don't have to be alone. Powerful. You know what's really amazing is, is sometimes somebody might come to you, and they might say, man, me and my husband are really... And, and, and all the circumstances, all the things they're laying out before you, in the natural eye, they might want to say, throw your hands up and quit. But you know what? You never know how something you might say like, you know what? Hang in there. Hang in there. Don't give up. Never quit. Let, just fight for this thing. And you never know how that thing comes out on the other side. I know for myself I've seen it. I, you know, I've seen people want to throw in the towel and maybe because of an encouragement word, you know, just, just encouraging them and saying, listen, fight for your marriage. Fight for your relationship. Fight for these things. And you know what? Nobody else has told them that. Everybody else has said, well, you got the right to do it. You, got, you can just do whatever you want. Just go. Just that. They did this. You did this. Da, 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 da. And, and they justify all these things. Yeah. But you know what? The right person stands up and says, you know what? If you're in love with your husband, you're in love with your wife, then don't give up. Fight. Right. Don't Fight. give up. Yeah. Don't quit. Listen, I thank God every day that my mother, who many of you know for years was in the church, my mother used to tell the story. She says, you know, there was a time when she said, I almost gave up on you, Bobby. But she says, I never, ever gave up. I kept praying for you, kept pressing in. And I, and, and I thanked her all the time. Like, Mom, never, thank you for never giving up. And I told a story one time about this guy that I was working with who was praying for me. And I remember Julia and I saw him right before we left for Russia. And, and we saw him in, a, in, a, in a, a grocery store, I think it was. And, and he came up to me, and I said, hey, how's it going? He said, how y'all doing? And I said, man, you ain't going to believe, because this guy was a real instrumental. I was working on a job. He's real instrumental in speaking to my life, and I got saved. And he said, how y'all doing? I said, man, you ain't going to believe it. We just graduated from seminary, and my wife and I are in the ministry. We're leaving for Russia. And his wife goes, I remember you. She says, I remember you. She says, you were the young man that, that his name was Mike. He said, well, Mike would come home just so frustrated. He said, man, that Bobby... He comes in, his eyes are bleeding. You know, he's been out all night long. And, he, and he, I just ain't no hope for that boy. I mean, he was just going and, said, and his wife would say, let's keep praying for him. Let's keep praying for him. And one day he said, Michael got up and said, baby, I just can't pray for that kid no more. I just, I, I, I'm so mad at him. I mean, he's just, he's at his, he's really just out there. And his, and his wife said, no, let's not. Let's keep praying for him. And that was the day that I'll never forget this. That was the day that I was climbing in a, in a catwalk. And I was about four stories high. 
working one of the plants, and I was snaking off. A, it was a, um, a cherry picker with a jig on it, and it was really high, and I was trying to snake in some pipe, and I was moving that pipe in, and the pipe got caught, and I was out on the ledge, and the pipe got caught, and I was trying to push it, and when I pushed it, it slipped, and when it did, I did, and I fell back. And I remember falling, and right below me, I mean, right below me was a piece of pipe about two inches, and my legs hit that pipe. And I remember dangling four stories above the, the, the there was some uh, uh, generators and all this stuff below me, and I'm dangling below this thing. And Mike just said, get up, boy, get up. And I got up, and I, and I was in shock. I got up, and I went to the, and of course, I collapsed. He grabbed me, hugged me. But his wife said this to me. She says, I remember the day that Mike said, let's give up on him. And he came home and told me that story. That happened. He said, aren't you glad we didn't give up on him? And I thought, I know I'm glad. <laughs> but you know what? There are people in our lives that we're in training, but guess what? We need to encourage them not to give up too. That's part of our training is helping other people get along this thing, helping other people cross the finish line. They had a story recently where this young lady was in a race, and, and they said that she was disqualified because she got out of her line, and she wouldn't help this lady. I think the lady was maybe handicapped or something. Put her on her arm and carried her across the finish line. And I thought, what a great reward is that, man. She wasn't worried about her own self-crossing. She was worried about this other person getting across it. And they both crossed. You know what? Isn't it victory when we can see other people cross it too? Father, we thank you for this day and this time. And God, I know that there are times when we feel like that our training has failed us. Or maybe times when we just we're tired and weary, don't feel like training anymore. Or, God, maybe there's some things that we spoke about today that maybe pierced the hearts of some people, and they realize that these are some of the areas that need to really work on and some of the rules of engaging their training they should fulfill and, and carry out. Whatever it may be. Maybe you're here today, heads bowed, eyes closed. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, man, something you said really ministered to me, and I realized that, man, for whatever reason, you might have gave up on a certain area of your life a certain training technique that I spoke about today that you need to maintain and keep in your life. Whatever it may be, I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. Say, Pastor, would you pray for me? You really ministered to me today in some areas. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Just raise your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you so much that you minister to us in ways that only you can. God, you're so good that way. So God, I ask you for the hands that were lifted, that you just put encouraging people around them. I pray that an encouraging word today will help them, lift them up, help them fight the battle, help them continue and never give up. And God, you're so good. So God, blessings be upon those people. Whatever they stand in need of, you will provide. Still heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, there was a time in my life that I was serving the Lord, and I'm not now. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I've never invited Jesus in my heart. I want to encourage you today to simply pray this prayer. Say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, from this day forward, I serve you. Now, have you prayed that prayer for the first time or maybe prayed it as a prayer of rededication, it doesn't matter. I just want to pray for you. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you out. If you prayed that prayer, just simply raise your hand and put it back down. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for these hands. I thank you for these souls. God, I thank you for what you're doing in the kingdom of God. I pray blessings on them. God, I pray you put them in godly places and positions. They can be trained and learn from you. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. You receive that word. Let's give God a hand. Amen.